Welcome to the Radiant Visalia podcast. Join us at one of our two services, 9 a.m. and 1045 a.m. Download the Church Center app or visit our website, radiantvisalia.com, to stay connected with us. All right, enjoy. Uh, when I was 19 years old, um, I made a uh, pilgrimage uh, to Ireland, back where my, where my skin tone belongs. <laughs> and uh, I think we saw the, I was there for three weeks, we saw the sun three times. And uh, I thought, this is where my skin is from. And... Uh, and I wanted to come home bad. And I needed the sun, and I needed uh, salsa. There was, I couldn't find either of those things. There was no chips, there was no salsa, there was no sun, and I wanted to come home. Well, when you're 19, um, uh, three things matter to you, or at least three things matter to me. Uh, I, I cared deeply about music. Um, most of my paycheck was spent on these things that we call compact discs. Um, they were like a circular thing that played music. A small record. And uh, I I cared deeply about music. I I cared about my friends. My friends uh, were in many ways my family at that season in life. And uh, I cared deeply about fitting in. I never would have said it, but I did care about it. And while in Ireland, uh, in, in my attempts to fit in with a group and, and make some new friends, some Irish friends, uh, I started a, a conversation uh, with a group my age about what they listened to. You know, you're trying to make friends, trying to build bridges. What are you listening to? And um, of course, in my attempt to connect with them, I informed them that I loved you too. Because, I mean, what better bridge, right? And uh, they were quick to inform me that they loved you too as well. And that's when I said, I just bought their greatest hits. That's what I said. Again, in my attempt to connect, build a bridge, um, I just bought their greatest hits. And I'll never forget, the guy looked at me and said, real fans don't own the greatest hits. They own the albums that those hits are from. And of course, in my attempt to connect, make friends, uh, fit in, I, I felt ashamed. And, um, and they wanted me to feel that. I'm pretty confident. He could, have, he could have said a lot of things, but instead he said, if you're a real fan of U2, you do not own the greatest hits. You own the albums that those hits come from. And one of the benefits of teaching through a book of the Bible, we're teaching through the book of James right now, one of the benefits of teaching through a book is we don't just get to play the hits. We don't get to skip tracks. And honestly, this morning, I wish we could. You can't skip over the stuff that you determine doesn't apply to you. I don't like that song. I'm going to skip that song. I'm going to get to what's on the radio. You've got to listen to every track on the album when you teach through a book of the Bible, and you can't just play the radio hits, right? We can't just continue to teach um, the verses that appear on our coffee mugs and on our letterman's jackets. I got to go to a football game this Friday night. It was amazing. I haven't been to a high school football game since I left high school, and I felt rather emotional. It was amazing. 
And, uh, but there was Letterman's jackets. They were all out, and they all had some verses. Those verses, as you know, uh, none, of, none of them had James 5, 1 through 10, on the back of their Letterman's jacket. Uh, what we're going to look at here is a pretty obscure track, um, yet really important. And if we're going to be real fans of the Scriptures, we can't just play the hits. We can't just keep going down those well-worn paths. We're going to have to explore the other things that Scripture teaches. So that's one of the benefits of just mobbing through a book of the Bible, is we're not going to play what's on the radio. With that in mind, I'd like to present to you a deep track from James 5. Come now, you rich Weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you, and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. If the saying is true and money talks... What is it saying? If money talks, and I can't complete the rest of the saying, but if money talks, if your money took the stand, if your stuff took the stand, if your employees took the stand, if they were called on to witness and they could talk, what would they say? James is making the point here that money is talking. Money is saying something. It's testifying. It's crying out. It's a witness and it's been called to the stand. And the testimony will lead to judgment. How many of you uh, remember the last episode of uh, Seinfeld? The the final episode of Seinfeld? Where uh, Jerry and George, Kramer, Elaine, um, they actually, rather than helping a man who's being held up, they video him and instead of stepping in to rescue him as he's being held up they actually start to make jokes about his weight remember this am i alone here about the time i was buying cds i was also watching seinfeld it was a sitcom um and then as you remember they're they're like arrested they're indicted because they didn't step in and do something about it And then they call to the stand everyone who would testify against George, Jerry, Kramer, and Elaine. So you got to see all the characters we'd grown to love uh, over the years on Seinfeld. And they took the stand and said, this is who Jerry, who George, who Kramer, who Elaine are. They stood up and they witnessed against them, against their character. And if your money was called to the stand, if it had a voice, what would, it, what would it say about who you are? If your bank statement was stood up, what would it say about what you value? If your stuff was going to testify about your character and who you are, what would it have to say? What would your stuff have to say about who you trust? What would your stuff have to say about what you value? If it was called to the stand, what would it say? The essence of what James is saying here is that judgment is coming. It's certain. Judgment is coming because money's been misused and things and people have taken the stand to testify against the rich in the Lord at the highest court is hearing the case. Now, who is the audience? Who is this rebuke meant for? That's a question I was asking myself as I was reading it. Is Who is James talking to? 
Is he talking to rich, wealthy believers in the church? Or is he talking to rich, wealthy unbelievers outside of the church? And there's some debate that exists. Some people think that he is talking to people in the church. These are believers, wealthy believers in the church who've, who their, their head has been turned by wealth and riches. They've forgotten that it's not business as usual. Uh, the defense for this approach to the passage comes from the idea that this, this passage that we're studying starts just like the last passage that we studied. Remember, last week it started with, Come now, you who say. Come, come now, you who are arrogantly boasting. And it was a rebuke, and it was meant for those inside the church. And this passage starts the same way. Come now, you rich. So if the last passage was meant for us, and this one starts in the same way, maybe in the same way it's meant for us, for the rich insider, not the rich outsider. Also, James is addressing a church. So why would, he, why would he waste his time talking to outsiders when he's talking to insiders? But I don't find that that totally holds up because if you remember the prophets in the Old Testament, the prophets in the Old Testament were constantly declaring things over foreign nations that those foreign nations never heard. Those prophets were talking about outsiders, but they were talking about what God was going to do to the outsider by talking to the insider. They were talking to the people of God, to the believers, and declaring, pronouncing judgment over the unbeliever, over those foreign nations, right? Also, this passage might be written to outsiders, to those outside the community, because there's no invitation to repent. There's no expectation in this passage of salvation only the promise of certain judgment. There's no invitation to turn. So, some believe that James is talking to outsiders and, and not Christians. And the reason that he's talking to the insiders about the outsiders is because it would have brought comfort to a very poor church. So the church, which was poor, wanted to know, would have been comforted by the news that the Lord sees what's happening and He's going to do something about it. So, my belief is that this passage is meant for the unbelieving outsider, not the wealthy insider. And that the reason James is saying it to the church is because it would have brought great comfort to the church. It would have, break, it would have brought great comfort that they, knew, they would have known that justice was going to be served, that their employer might be ignoring them, but the Lord of hosts is not. The Lord of angel armies is what that means. The Lord of angel armies has not ignored them. He sees their plight. He sees what's going on and he intends to step in and do something about it. So, this could, this passage could bring conviction because they're are wealthy Christians caught up in the ways of the world. It could bring conviction this morning. It could also bring comfort because there are many of us that are impoverished. Some of you tuned right out. When it said, come now you rich, you were like, this one ain't for me. You were like, I'm a lot of things. I'm messed up in a lot of ways, but that's not one of the ways I'm messed up. This is not for me. This could bring comfort for some. This could bring conviction for most. Please don't count yourself out when you read the word rich. We're it. We're them. The rich. I know. There's, like, you're no, there's no way. There is no way. We are. We're in the top, I don't know what percent. But please don't tune out. Please don't decide this isn't for you because either way, no matter who James talking, is talking to you, no matter the audience, there's a message here for anyone who has wealth at their disposal. No matter how much or how little. 
There's a message here for anyone who has wealth at their disposal. James is, is showing all of us the pits so that we don't fall into them, right? He's teaching us how to use wealth by exposing these glaring abuses. So even if you find yourself this morning going, I don't struggle with that, please understand that James is trying to instruct us. James is using these glaring abuses in order to teach us. So there's something for us in this, okay? We good? So a couple things before we get started concerning um, money is that James is not condemning wealth in general. That it's not a sin to be wealthy. And that can creep in in our uh, thinking. That we can think it's spiritual to be poor and that it is a sin to be wealthy. And James is not condemning wealth in general. Many heroes in Scripture were wealthy. Including Job, who was righteous. Abraham, the father of our faith, a wealthy man. Joseph of Arimathea, David. I mean, these were wealthy men. Many of our heroes were wealthy men. Wealth, in general, is not being condemned here. James is wanting to address, how'd you get that? How did you line your pockets? What is going on with your heart and are you using what you have to bless others or are you using others to get more of what you really want that's his issue his issue is that these people are possessed by their possessions it's not bad to have wealth it's not bad to have possessions it's a bad thing when they have you and that's what james is bringing up here right the Bible doesn't teach that money is evil or condemn wealth. The Bible teaches that the love of money is at the root of all evil. The love of money. I had a boss at the gas company. His name was Greg. And I wish I had video of this, but I came in. He knew that I was a zealous young Christian trying to convert him. And he said to me, Travis, he said, if money is the root of all evil, why is the church always asking me for mine? That was his, his beef with church. And I got to correct him and I got to say, Greg, it's actually the love of money that's the root of all evil and that's why we always ask you for it. We want to give you plenty of opportunities to separate from that thing that so easily entangles, you know? And he, he didn't buy it. He didn't come to church. But I made my case, right? Money itself is not evil it's the love of money, again, being possessed by those possessions that is at the root of all kinds of stuff. And in this passage, it's at the root of hoarding, it's at the root of fraud, it's at the root of indulgence, and it's at the root of murder. Right? Money isn't evil. Uh, the way I would say it is I would say money is dangerous. So proceed with caution. Don't always assume that having more of it will be to your advantage because the Scriptures present wealth as a handicap, not as an advantage that opens things up, but as a handicap that potentially closes things down. I'll explain this. But I want you to think of money uh, the way you think of fire. Fire's not evil. In fact, you can do some amazing things with fire, right? Right? You can cook with it, stay warm, light something up with it, right? You can power things with fire. Fire is amazing. You could also burn some stuff to the ground with it. You can also destroy. Any firemen in here? Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. You can <laughs> cause some real damage with it. And what I want you what I want to challenge this morning is the assumption inside of every one of us that it will be to our advantage if we have more wealth. If we only had more, more would open up to us because that's not what Jesus taught. Look at this passage you, you've probably heard or read Jesus, uh, his, the way he corrected the rich young ruler. 
a rich young man came to him and said, hey, how do I inherit eternal life? How do I get in? And Jesus said, well, do these things. And the young man said, done. Already did it. And then Jesus said, okay, one thing you lack, sell everything you own. Because he loved him. That's what the passage says. Because he loved him, he said, sell everything you own. Come follow me. And it says that the young man went home disheartened. And he was sorrowful because he had great possessions. And he was possessed by those possessions. He couldn't let go of those things. And then listen to the teaching that Jesus turns and gives his disciples. And let it challenge the thinking that if you had more, you'd be better off. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. Again, because it challenged this assumption that if I had more money, if I had more wealth, things would open up for me. And Jesus is saying to them, no, actually, things will close down. There's a real danger. The disciples, they were amazed at his words. And Jesus said to them again, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And then they were exceedingly astonished. No way. Because the narrative they lived in was if I had more, more would open up for me. If I had more, I'd be in an advantage. And he's saying, no, it's actually a disadvantage. It's difficult to go where I'm going. So they were astonished and they said to him, then who the heck can be saved? He didn't say that, but they said, then who can be saved? But I added the heck. And Jesus looked at them and said, with man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. The point that Jesus makes over and over again is that it is impossible for someone who trusts in riches to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's impossible for someone who's trusting in riches to enter the kingdom of heaven. And here's the truth. Money is an easy thing to trust in. Money is an easy thing to put our trust in. So we're warned continuously, don't be caught leaning on this stuff. Don't be caught betting on this stuff. It's easy to get possessed by our possessions. Can I get an amen? I mean, isn't it easy? Oh, money, so much would open up to me if we just had more. Money will keep me. Money will protect me. Money will make a way for me. Money will secure me. Money will be my functional savior. I'm tired. I'm tired. If I, if I just had more, I could sit back. There'd be less striving going on. I mean, come on. This is the story we live in. This is what we tell ourselves on the daily. Riches may open doors down here, but they may close some doors. So don't always decide that it's to your advantage. It's dangerous, so proceed with caution. Here's the other thing you need to know about money. Money, at the the same time, will tell you the truth about where you're at and lie to you about what you need. Money will tell the truth about what you really value. It's a truth teller, no doubt. And then it's a filthy liar. (laughs) The deceitfulness of riches will tell you a lie about what you actually need. Money will tell the truth. Jesus said, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy. You can see the, the basis here for what James would say to the church later on. Where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus is essentially saying, show me your money and I'll show you what you really have a heart for. And we can deceive ourselves into thinking that we have a heart for all kinds of things. Uh, Just this week I was in a conversation uh, with Josie. Uh, Shaw and I was telling her like I really have a heart for this group of people I felt real moved emotionally I was actually crying or fighting back tears as I told her I had a real heart for it and unfortunately I'd spent my week reading this scripture and I found myself thinking if I really had a heart for these people how come they don't show up on my bank statement 
if I really care as deeply as I say I care about them? How come you couldn't find them in my spending? Is it true that I actually care about them? Jesus is saying, you say all you want. Say you're this, that. Say you got a heart for this, you got a heart for that. Oh man, I, I so love Jesus. He's changed my life. And I want nothing more than to see His kingdom come and go forth. And Jesus is saying, if it doesn't show up on your bank statement, you don't actually have a heart for what you say you have a heart for. And this can be really discouraging. How many feel really discouraged at this point? Great. This can be really discouraging, right? It sucks to look at your bait statement and realize like, that what you really value is burritos. Like that's what you really want in life, you know? That's discouraging, you know? It's discouraging to look at it and just, and, and just honestly realize that what you worship is comfort. It's what you want most in this life. And you want to, at all costs, avoid risk. That's discouraging. But money will tell the truth about what you value. And then at the same time, it's, this is kind of encouraging. Because this means that if you want your heart to grow for something, you can start giving towards it and your heart will follow that. Isn't that cool? Because Some of you are like, no, I think deep down I do care about world <laughs> missions. I do care about unreached people groups. I do care about the poor in our community. Right on. Start giving. Start giving towards those things. I think your heart will grow. You know, e even towards those that you're bitter towards. Start being generous towards them. Start giving. Just in an act of obedience. You don't feel it right now. You don't feel connected to that cause. You don't feel connected to that person. But start sowing in. I think your heart will grow. So at the same time, this is super discouraging and super encouraging. You can begin to funnel money towards those things that you want your heart to grow towards. So money's dangerous. I want you to know that. Don't always decide that it's to your advantage. And it will tell the truth. And it will lie to you at the same time. It's kind of, kind of wild, right? The deceitfulness of riches. The deceitfulness of riches or the snare that gets set for those who pursue wealth is that you, you can start to think to yourself, if I only had that then I would be worry-free or it would solve. If I had this stuff, it would solve my anxiety. My anxiety would go away. If I had this amount in the account, then I would feel secure and I wouldn't feel so anxious about tomorrow. I would be worry-free if I could just get to this place. And then this place just eludes us. Right? It promises to relieve anxiety. If you had more money, it promises to relieve anxiety, but then it produces the very thing you think it's going to relieve. You put your hope in the wrong thing and you will pay for it perpetually. Right? Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said it like this, do not be anxious. This is the charge. And he says, earthly Possessions dazzle our eyes and delude us into thinking they can provide security and freedom from anxiety. Yet all the time, they are the very source of all anxiety. If our hearts are set on them, our reward is an anxiety whose burden is intolerable. Look, I know that there's an anxiety to having no employees. But wait till you experience the anxiety that comes with having employees. <laughs> Do you understand what happens? Like we get to the end of the rainbow and then it's something else and then it's something else and it sets a snare. It puts us on a treadmill. Right? I, I had a car. Um, my first car was just a beater. And, uh, and, and it produced a certain anxiety. Would it start? Would it start was the question I would ask as I got in it, right? I wasn't worried about being scratched. 
if someone said to me, like, your car got scratched, I, I honestly, I wouldn't have been able to tell. It's like, where? It is one big scratch. How could someone damage this? My favorite thing to do in my 1979 mustard yellow Volvo station wagon um, was on trash day when your full trash cans were put out, I would drive down the street and just take them out. I would knock them over, we would laugh, trash would fly, and it it was our goal to put it up on the lawn, and that's what we did, that's what was the fun for us. And so if you would have come up to me and said, I I think during that last run you dented the front of your car, I would have been like, whatever, I I don't care about this car. And then you get a new car, and you're park. I don't want to park there. I want to park out here where no one is going to park next to me because you do then notice the scratch. And there is a new anxiety surrounding the new car. The anxiety surrounding the old car was could I get to the coast to go on a surf trip? That was it. That's all I cared about. Would it take me there? And then you trade in the old car for a new car and you're like, don't eat that. No one eats in this car. And, I, and you're backing into the parking spot, right? instead of pulling in. So understand that it promises to relieve anxiety. And that anxiety never goes away. You just trade it for a new set of anxieties. This is how I like to liken it. My uh, dad chewed tobacco growing up. And my favorite time of the year was when my dad tried to quit chewing tobacco. And it was usually the result of one of us kids at a young age getting a hold of his spittoon and drinking what was in it. And it would just, it would freak my mom out. And she would be like, that's it, you're disgusting, this is disgusting, this stops now. The reason it was my favorite time of the year is because in order to stop that, the house got stocked with Jolly Ranchers, seeds, (laughs) suckers, whatever my dad wanted to stuff in his mouth to try to get him over that addiction. And so often for us, we just trade one addiction for another. It's like, well, this one thing is causing me anxiety. If I just had more of it, my anxiety would go away. And you're right, and then you would get a new anxiety, right? It'll tell you the truth, and then it'll tell you a lie. That it can secure you. That it can promise you freedom and a worry-free life. And you continue to hoard and to have and to hold things closely, thinking that it's going to provide freedom, but instead it's bondage. And I, I, think, I think that's what James would say. I think that's what Jesus would say. I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure that when James takes aim right here, he takes aim at how you got your money. He cares about how you got it. He cares about what money is doing to your heart. And He cares about how you're using it. Are you using it to bless others? And He's got a problem with four things here in this passage. He's got a problem with hoarding. He's got a problem with fraud. He's got a problem with indulgence. And He's got a problem with with murder. So hoarding. Verse 5. Come now, or sorry, verse 1. Come now you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and it will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. In the last days, uh, we're living in the time between the times. We're living in the time between Jesus' first coming and His second coming, also known as the last days. And what James is saying here is that there's an amazing opportunity for those living in the last days. For those living in the time between the times, there's an amazing opportunity. And instead of being a good steward of what you have for those opportunities, you've stockpiled stuff. And it's starting to rot. And it's pointless. You're feeding the moths. There's an amazing opportunity to seize. And instead of seeing that opportunity, you've sought to secure yourself by stockpiling stuff. 
If you've got the NIV, it says you have hoarded wealth in the last days. Laid up treasures. Right? This is one we can all relate to. As we get towards the end, I don't know how many are actually thinking about murdering someone, but hoarding, I think, is something we can all relate to. Through the five major media outlets... That is TV, internet, radio, magazine, news. Through the five major media outlets, you'll see an average of 360 advertisements a day. A day. And we thought we had this whooped, right? We thought we had this beat. We paid for Hulu. We paid for Netflix. We blocked those pop-ups and we thought, we've, we've made it. No, no, no. 360 times a day, you're being invited into discontentment and enrolled into buying something. 360 times a day. That's just the five major media outlets. That does not include billboards. And that does not include having your car wrapped with an ad. 360 times a day, you're being told you need this. 360 times a day, you're being told you don't have this. You don't have this. 360 times a day, you're, you're being told what you have is old and you need this because it's new. 360 times a day, you're being told what you have is not cool and what you need is this because it's cool. And all of these ads work off creating discontentment. They feed off of it. They know deep down you're discontent and they play off of it, right? It shows the like disheveled mom and it's like, are you still mixing cake batter like this? You know, and her hair is like disheveled and the kids are everywhere and you know, there's cake batter just flying and it's like, try the Mixer 2000. You know, it's like they play off your discontent. Are you fat? I am. I am. Well, let me offer you this solution to this place you're stuck in, right? Do you have zits? Totally. Totally. Are you cool with those pimples? No. I've never been cool with those pimples. Try whatever it is that they're selling. It, it all works off of and plays on this thing inside of us that's discontent with where we're at. And if you think that you're not phased by 360 invitations a day, you're wrong. If you think you chose the clothes that you're wearing just because they're comfortable, you're wrong. Unless you're here in Crocs and sweats. <laughs> I don't see you if you're here. But you're wrong, man. We're being shaped by this. You're a fool to think that this isn't affecting you. It's really having an effect on us. Um, how many of you have had the experience in a a third world country of going to one of their markets and being completely overwhelmed by the businessmen that are pulling on your sleeve. Come in, come in, I make your deal. You know, and you're like, oh man, no, I don't want to go in there. I don't even want that. You see this? I'm trying to sell you on something, right? Every trip I go on, we go to get souvenirs and it's exhausting walking through the marketplace constantly. I mean, you're feeling harassed. I think for us as Westerners, we're not used to bargaining. We're not used to even talking about the price of things. The price is what they said the price was, you know, and the finagling. It's just exhausting. We did it in India. It was terrible, right? And we all at the end of the day were like, that was exhausting getting pulled on like that by every vendor we walked past was saying, come in, come in, I'll make you deal, you know. Everyone's calling at you. We are walking in the same thing on a daily basis. And maybe it's not a vendor that you're walking past their storefront, but on a daily with the images that we see and the advertisements that we're exposed to, you're being pulled on and you're being shaped. Our culture is doing an amazing job of discipling, talking to you about what you need to value, what you need to value. And who, what you need to be valuable, right? So let me just speak, let Timothy 6 just speak to this, right? I just feel like there's an invitation for us 
from this passage or, or in this challenge to not hoard, to cultivate contentment, which is something you have to cultivate. Contentment is not something you just have. You have to cultivate contentment. 1 Timothy 6, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of this world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. What a cool story to tell yourself. If we have food and clothing, with these we'll be content. Timothy seems to be saying here, look, if you've got pants and a burrito, you're going to be fine. It just, it's so... Uh, man, I mean, just to even say it, like, the car we have is fine. The house we have is great. The kids I've got are awesome. The wife God's given me, she's amazing. I mean, just utter those words. It's so powerful because that's not the story we live in. I need that car. I need a spouse more like that. God, why did you give me this one? I wish my kids were like this, but they're not. They're like that. Gratitude. Gratitude will cultivate contentment. It's the only way to cultivate contentment and to fight against the 360 invitations you get a day to be discontent, to be grateful. Oh man, I like these jeans. I mean, honestly, there's like a relief in no longer buying into this lie of scarcity and believing that what you have is enough. Gratitude is a way to cultivate contentment. It tunes you in to the good gifts that you've already got, which is just not where we live. Generosity will grow contentment. Because we, we've got an assignment. We've got something we're going to do with the more that comes in. And deciding that we've got enough and giving that, opening our hands with what we have will cultivate contentment. Hoarding is a denial of the proper use of wealth. Hoarding is a denial of proper trust in God. Hoarding is a denial of the reality that we will account for what we have and what we've done with what we have. It's a denial of the godly expectancy that we're going to have to answer and that our stuff is going to say something about where we placed our trust and how we lived our lives. And I know there's some of you thinking, you know, well, what about wisely stewarding money, right? And I, we are called to be responsible and wisely steward money, but putting your hope in money is something totally different. Putting your hope in it. Two different things. And a lot of us will be found this Christmas se season buying things for a future garage sale. Fraud. James has got beef with it. Behold the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud. They're crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. There's some dishonest and um, people are being dishonorable in how they're paying their workers. And it was surprising me to find that the, the Scriptures are pretty detailed in how you should treat or pay your workers. Deuteronomy 24 says, You shall not oppress a hired worker who is poor and needy, whether he is one of your brothers or one of the sojourners who are in your land within your towns. You shall give him his wages on the same day before the sun sets, for he's poor and counts on him. Essentially, a day without pay was a day without food. Lest he cry against you to the Lord and you be guilty of sin. Please notice that like, rather than James talking about how that's so messed up, that that guy who worked for you will not be paid. In, in a time of harvest, Like that means the bank account's full and you're still not paying your employees because you want to hoard. And instead of James saying, that's wrong, that poor guy isn't going to eat today, instead of dealing with it on a horizontal level, he goes straight to the vertical and he says, I want you to know that that person's cry has come to me is being heard, and I will act on their behalf. The Lord of angel armies will step in. And again, this would have 
brought great comfort to the poor who were being overlooked, to know that they weren't being overlooked by God. God was hearing their cry. God was going to step in and do something even though their employers were not. As an employer, it would be good to ask this question, is anyone crying out because of me? Is anyone crying out because of me? If my employees took the stand, what would they say? If they saw me at church, would they be surprised? Indulgence. You've lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You've fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. Uh, Luxury and self-indulgence, they come together to present this picture of the soft life. You've lived a pampered life. You've actually, uh, it translated, this says you lived delicately. You lived delicately. You lived pampered. You lived without any self-denial. You lived a life without no. Wealth can cushion us. It can insulate us. It can cushion us. And when it cushions, it dulls our sense of spiritual urgency. That's why he says you just keep getting fatter and fatter as in the day of slaughter. It dulls your sense of urgency. It dulls your connection to need, right? And you're like a cow that's just grazing, getting fatter and fatter and not knowing that you will account for your life, right? That when, I, when I've watched you know, someone take an elk, you know, the elk is just grazing. Fatter and fatter, not knowing, bam, in a moment. You're going to meet your maker and have to answer for the way that you spent your life. Since we're playing the deep tracks today, can I read Luke 16, a parable that doesn't get read as much as the parable of the sower. There was a rich man, Jesus told this story, there was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen who feasted every day, sumptuously every day. He was living the pampered life. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. And the poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. And the rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things. And Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he's comforted here and you are in anguish. James is taking aim at people living this life as if this life is all there is. Like there's just no thought of a heaven to be gained or a hell to be avoided. They're living soft lives with no sense of self-denial. That we're living in the time between the times with this amazing opportunity. And then murder. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. I think there's two things going on. One thing here is that these wealthy have bought the courts. The power is with those who have money, right? And the poor couldn't even get a hearing. And the rich were using the process of the law to get their own way. And affluence can open the door to a carelessness. Affluence can open the door to carelessness and an insensitivity towards others. You can forget that what you have is a gift. Well, I earned this. And what they got, they got. They made that bed. They sleep in it. An insensitivity, right? And I guess the question to ask is, have I victimized someone because of a power advantage that I possess? Have I victimized someone because of a power advantage that I possess? That's the question to ask. 
And I know at this point you're probably like, are you kidding me, Travis? Are you going to try to apply this point to my life? That I'm going to murder someone for money. This still goes on. If you love those like Dateline mysteries, you know, the 2020s where it's like, who killed her, right? Well, spoiler alert, it's always the spouse. It's always the spouse. And most of the time, it's always to get your hands on the life insurance policy. This still goes on. Oh, those primitive people back then. No, no, no. This is the Dateline special that you watch. So, worship team, would you come? So if money talks, if money talks, what does hoarding say? What does fraud say? What does indulgence say? What does murder say? I think they all say the same thing. I'm going to save my own butt. I'm going to save my own rear. Rather than trusting Jesus to save me, I'm going to hoard. I'm going to have. I'm going to hide. I'm going to insulate. I'm going to overpower. And I'm going to save me. Money will keep me. Money will protect me. Money will secure me. Money will defend me against an uncertain future. That's a lie. That is a lie. And like all good lies, it's half true. Matthew 6, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Love God and love people and use your money this season. Love God and love people and use your money. Don't love money and use people. That's what James is saying here. Don't love money and use people. You can't read this last line without thinking about Jesus. You really can't. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one, the righteous one, who was not resisting you. He was not opposing you. You came after Him, and He was not your problem. I want to open it up. Seems fitting that we would conclude our service by worshiping and coming to the table and remembering the righteous one, the innocent one, the one who was not opposing us, who gave his life for us. If you are here and you would say, I'm guilty, man, of laying up treasures on earth, of thinking money was going to save me, here's the good news. You can repent today and put your trust in Jesus and say, Jesus, I'm trusting you for security. I've been looking to money to do that and it's not working. And we can do that because He's made a way for us. Remember, trust in His body that was broken for you. That that is your security. What He's done on your behalf. His blood shed for you. That's your security. That's your provision. So as you come, remember the righteous one who didn't resist the cross but paid for us Declare the worth of Jesus in song. And then we'll pray for you. There'll be people up front to pray. I know that some of you are like, well, I can't respond to an altar call that has to do with murder. I've not killed anyone. I do know that this season is marked by loads of strife, specifically around money. And many of us have been stuck in ruts relating to money in a certain way without perspective, without breakthrough, and just in need. So if you're here, and as a person, as a couple, you just want someone to pray, bless that area of your life, declare God's Word over you, then we'd love to pray for you in this season. And we won't assume if you respond to get prayer that you've committed fraud or killed anyone. Because maybe that's not where you're at right now. But, if you're just like, man, this area just drains our energy, just sucks. Uh, We'd love to to pray for you. Would you stand? Thank you. Jesus, we we just acknowledge that um, 
our culture has uh, shaped us, and uh, we've been lied to, and we've bought in. And uh, I want I want to pray that you would, with your light, expose the lies that we've bought into about where provision comes from, where security comes from, and you would expose, Lord, what needs to be exposed, and then uh, with. <laughs> with your body and blood, would you not just expose it, would you cover over it, Lord? I feel like God would remind us this morning that He's not looking just to call things out, but when He calls things out, He wants to cover over them as well. Lord, would you deal with our shame in this area? We're just embarrassed of our accounts. We're embarrassed of the ways that we've spent money. Embarrassed of our track record. And uh, I do want to ask that you would break the power of shame and come in and do a new thing in us concerning finances. In Jesus' name, amen. Come receive communion. Lift your voices to Him. When you're done, you're free to go. We'll see you next week. Make sure to thank those who were with and loving on your kids. Thanks for listening. We want to be a resource for you as you walk with Jesus. So please connect with us at radiantvicelia.com. Until next time. There is a heavenly city that I'm compelled to find. Oh, I love the flowers and trees and the smell of the grinding sea. And all the beautiful things here in life. And I-